So let's let's talk about the music. Let's start with the music first. Let's talk about the song that we just heard, which was uh, produced by the composers, right? Yes. Uh, let me get their names. The original composers, which are N Nate, Roman. Nate and Roman. Yes. So Nate and Roman are um, the they're Janelle Monae's composers. So they do all her music. Oh, so they okay. they're from their Wonderland, okay. which is Janelle Monae's um, company. Uh huh. Uh, I just saw her last her concert last night. And Amazing. how was it? It was, I mean, it was mind blowing. It was was she rolling on the floor again? She was rolling on the floor. <laughs> it was incredible. It was like church. It was like going to church. Okay. It was amazing. Um, but they're so brilliantly talented. And you know, so what I said to them was, okay, we're gonna take the, we're gonna start with the sounds of a slave ship. What, what, how did the in the in the hull of that ship, the slaves would soothe themselves by banging chains, by moving, by humming to themselves, and, and using those sounds and evolving those sounds the way, the way music and the way American music has evolved, right? It all started from that. You know, then to the fields, to the, to the fields, the cotton fields, to, so it was really about taking that base and really evolving it um, as the movie progresses. It was beautifully very, very, done. Very, very I, I love the music quite a bit. Wasn't the music great? The original music that we heard, it was really lovely. Bert Blackarack, our music supervisor, oh. an incredible job. I mean, it's not easy to clear Tyler, the creator, but he was, he was pretty amazing. Okay, <laughs> I, I caught that one too. <laughs> so let's flip around to the women. I, most of the time when I see these types of documentaries, and I see a lot of documentaries, the talking heads and the narratives are usually done by the majority of them are done by men. Yep. I love that it was all women. I'm just gonna run down their names. Miss Brittany Cooper, Autumn Womack, Dr. Imani Perry, Dr. Kelly Carter Jackson, Dr. Carol Anderson, Brittany Packnick Cunningham, Dr. Dorothy Roberts, Dr. Elizabeth Hinton, Honore Fanon ja Jefferson, I got that right, okay. Dr. Jennifer L. Morgan, Dr. Ruha Benjamin, Dr. Stephanie E. Jones Rogers, Dr. Angela Davis, Dr. Zende, who the book is based, the book, the film is based on his book. And of course, I had to go in for my girl. I'm going to keep it black, but I'm going to keep it brief, Miss Lene Vene. Oh, love Lene. <laughs> I want to talk about how you ended up with Lene Vene. She's an activist and an educator. And I see her on Instagram every Friday. She drops something, and it's usually whatever was hot and heavy in the news. Yep. And she goes in on it. How did you uh, approach getting her for this? I saw her on Instagram like you. And I was like, she's amazing. I mean, she, she's so amazing, her, her Instagram. That, who was her latest famous guest? Michelle Obama. Yes. Was on, and she does, it's called Parking Lot Pimpin'. And she sits in the parking lot and she drinks tea and she keeps it black and keeps it real. She, keep, she says, I'm going to keep it black, but I'm going to keep it brief. <laughs> That's what she says. Brief. Yeah. It's, That's what she it says. So she's brilliant. Um, so how it all began is that I got a list of experts. You know, they, they, they gave me someone, I don't know, my producer, Lisa Payne, my amazing producer, gave me a list, Lisa, uh, Lisa Fan. And um, I looked at the list and I was like, oh God, it's the same, you know, it's a lot of, you know, the, the usual historians and academics, the, you know, Doris Kern Goodwins and the, the you know, so I, but I noticed a pattern that, doing the work around racism were black women, you know, because they've always been at the forefront doing this work. And I was like, oh wait, at these black women who are at Yale and Stanford and Harvard and Howard, and they were doing this work, and I was like, this is gonna be a statement. I wanna do just only black women. And there was pushback there was pushback. What kind of pushback? I, I, this is um, what I want to know. I was told that it was not going to be mainstream, broad, and you know all those terms, broad enough. Um, if I was going to restrict it to black women, I said they're the ones doing this work, and they do this work because they have no choice. You know, they they're black, and they and this is their chosen work. But but the black women have always been at the forefront of the movement. They've always been at the forefront of the movement. Ida B. Wells, the I, list goes on. Yeah. Phyllis so, Wheatley, you know. So I fought, I, I fought back and I said, nope, I'm not budging. And um, I got my way. Well, I'm glad you did. Cause the, I immediately, as the, as the film began to progress, 
that was the one thing that stuck out to me. And I was like, I love this. I love that this is mostly educated black women in the highest spaces possible that are commenting in this film. It was a brilliant move on your part. Congratulations. Can I say something too? I yes. told them not to, I said, look, you're not gonna do your usual academic interview where you're just telling us, this is personal to you and you need to talk about it. As It's like, for, throw that out the door and you're just gonna talk to me as a black woman. And you know, so they, so they just, they got emotional and they told their personal stories. I mean, the Ida B. Wells, you know, the, 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 and the Phyllis Wheatley moment. Yes, when, when, when someone in the film said, every black Honor. woman has had a Phyllis Wheatley moment. Yeah, that, yeah. That. Honor, Honor Reed tells her Phyllis Wheatley moment, mm -hmm. you know. That so. struck me to my core, because we have. I've, I've had mine too, so th that's something people, that was real. People come up to me who've seen the film, and they're, they tell me, like, black people tell me they're a Phyllis Wheatley moment. Black men, black women, you know, we all have Phyllis Wheatley moments. What's yours? Know. I have many Phyllis Wheatley moments. Pick uh, one. We want to know. Um, uh, I don't know. I, I, I mention don't... no name. <laughs> I'm not going to tell nobody. It's just us, right? I mean, right? I feel like my whole career is a Phyllis Wheatley moment, you know, justifying myself all the time. You know, that's, and as a black person in, in an industry where there aren't a lot of, you know, I don't, I'm often the only black person in the room, you know. I had to go, you know, I was elected. I was lucky enough to be elected the governor of the documentary branch of the Academy of Motion Pictures Arts and Congratulations, Science. yes. And I entered that room only the second person ever to, to only second black person ever on the board after Cheryl Boone Isaacs. Wow. And I walked into that room and it's all mostly white men, powerful white men, you know, Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks and the most powerful people in Hollywood. And I was like, oh shit, I could be intimidated by this or I could, you know, kick over the table and, you know, break the door down for everyone. Now the board is completely different. You know, we have um, Ruth Carter and and Ava and you know um, Wynn Thomas and all these, you know. But it was rough going in the beginning, and no one would look at me or talk to me. Really, I was invisible in that room, but wow. I had to make myself heard. You make yourself heard with every single film that you do, and you know I have seen them all. I want to talk, I'm going to skip around talking about um, moments. The thing that really struck me was a clip that I had never seen from Martin Luther King, where he said, somebody told a lie one day. They made everything black, ugly, and evil. Look in the dictionary and see the synonyms of the word black. So I did. And these were the words that I found. Dark, disastrous, dirty, Tragic, wretched, woeful, ruinous, terrible, aggressive, belligerent, threatening, hostile, and wicked. And that just touches the surface. Wow. How do you feel when you hear that? Because when I heard him say that, I had never, we always associate Dr. King with nonviolence and not saying those, making those types of statements. And of course, he probably made many statements many, like that, many. but they're never publicized, they're never put in a film like they were this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you internalize all that as a black person. You know, I internalized all this self-hatred self mm -hmm. as, a, as a black person. When I read the book, I was like, my eyes were open, I was transformed, because I didn't know how much, I mean, even Kendi himself talks about this, you know, in, in his book. He had the number one, you know, during the racial reckoning, he had the number one New York Times bestseller, How to Be an Anti-Racist. Mm -hmm. And he talks about that, that even, even someone who is an anti-racist, who works his whole career to, to, to really, you know, talk about being an anti-racist, also internalized this sort of, you know, this, this, these racial ideas just, just, Every, even black people, the way we think about ourselves. So how can you not when that's in the dictionary? And then this was the when other I made the movie. Right. <laughs> and this was the other thing too. So right behind him, you have the clip of Malcolm X. Now Malcolm X is also known for, you know, not he's known for saying very controversial things is the best way for me to say it. But when he said this, it made me sit up and think. When he said, Who taught you to hate the color of your skin? Who taught you to hate the texture of your hair? Who taught you 
that the shape of your nose and the shape of your lips is bad. Who taught you how to hate yourself from the top of your head to the soles of your feet? And when I heard him say that, I thought that is how any person in this country who has ever been othered feels because that's how you're made to feel. And I love that you put those, I, I, what I mostly loved about Stamped from the beginning is that you didn't shy away from the hard parts. Those are hard parts. Those are hard parts for black people to hear and listen to and see. Yeah, you know, um, growing up, my mother who was raised in the South in Charleston, South Carolina, who was a maid um, her whole life, um, she would say to me, you can't wear your hair in dreadlocks. You won't get a job. People won't respect you. She goes, hold your nose, your nose is too big. She would, she internalized all this stuff. And I think about my mother when I was making this film, you know, that she was a, she was a proud black woman who taught me everything, you know, and gave me, gave me everything she had, but she internalized all this self-hatred. And that really, it's, 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 it's so painful to think about. You know, and um, so that's why, you know, I made the movie, that's why that's in there. I love that it was in there. I also love the part about code switching, because that's real. So somebody laughed, you know what I'm talking about. Whoever that was, like chuckled, you know exactly what I mean. So with, with our community, oftentimes, we will, just like you were talking about being in that boardroom for the academy, I'm sure that there was a part of you that felt like, uh-oh, I'm, I'm gonna have to code switch so that I don't intimidate anybody. Did, did that ever cross your mind during that moment? I code switch all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think, you know, even to get elected, you know, even to, you know, and it's, it's exhausting. You know how it is, it's exhausting. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it, is so. it is very exhausting, really much so. The other clip that I saw that kind of took me by surprise was the one of Obama where he talks to the young man, tells him, pull, pull up your pants, stop, have some respect for yourself. We'd never heard him speak to another black man like that. We'd never, we, all we'd seen was the photographs of, of the little boy touching his hair and go, oh, isn't that cute? I never saw that. I was like, well, okay. I'm looking, I'm looking at all of these people that you featured in this film very differently than yeah, I did going yeah. into it. I mean, you know, one of the things I learned when I read the book you know, was that the idea that assimilationist ideas are racist ideas and that we have to look at assimilationism. And that was why this, that was why it was so important. The, the, the Phyllis Wheatley section, this whole, this whole section about assimilationism was so important. And I'm sure, you know, I'm sure you're not happy about that. You know, neither is probably, um, you know, Secretary Clinton that she's, that the super predator thing comes up, you know, or, or, you know, so, these ideas are permeate everything in American, you know, sort of culture and politics, and so uh, no one's sort of, you know, immune to it. It's everywhere. No, and and that's the other that's the other thing that I admire that you didn't shy away from. A lot of the people that you featured, the Clintons, the Obamas, the MLKs, the Malcolm Xs, a lot of these people have been in uh, Trump, um, Reagan. All of these people have either even either been reviled, revered, or admired at some point in time by one aisle or the other. And you did not shy away from showing moments of all of them that weren't lovely. Yeah. The one moment that, speaking to Trump, the one moment that made me laugh out loud is that there's that whole section in the film dedicated to Abraham Lincoln. And there's that, <laughs> you know what I'm about to say. There's that clip of Trump saying, I've done more for the African-American community than Abraham, not, yeah, than Abraham Lincoln. And then we ha talk about Thomas Jefferson and how there's a whole, when Lene Vene was like, Thomas Jefferson is full of, you know what? I said, oh, this is funny. So Thomas Contradiction Jefferson. Yes, the contradictions of Thomas Jefferson. That was amazing because he has, he's another one who was revered in the media, even on Sesame Street. You showed the little clip of him being revered on Sesame Street and in Hamilton, and as a black man in Hamilton. I was like, oh Lord, there's a lot, <laughs> there's, a there's a lot, lot to, going there's on. There's a lot to unpack. There's a lot to, to unpack watch there. it over and over and over again. <laughs> there's a lot to unpack there, but I appreciated the fact that you went there. I, I just want to segue and, and go into um, Phyllis Wheatley for a moment, if we might. Um, we're in a year right now where there are a lot of books that are being banned by LGBTQ plus people, people of color, and women. Um, 
this book, Stamped from the Beginning, was one of the books that was banned. And I just wonder, how do you think we're going to come on the other side of this if we keep having these books that are banned by these types of authors where they are literally trying to stamp the history away from the beginning? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think one of the things that I try to say in this film is that when there's a backlash, when there's a, a racist backlash, there's a huge resistance. Mm -hmm. And we're, as, as, you know, as African Americans, we are resilient people. And, there's, and there, will, there is a resistance, even though Kendi's probably one of the most banned books, you know, Kendi, Nicole Henry, I mean, they're all, you know, ta of everyone, all of them, but like, there is a resistance, and there will be, um, it'll, it'll go the other way, because we're not gonna give up, we're gonna fight. We're gonna fight, and just for basic human rights and human decency and basic understanding. So I'm, I'm totally optimistic, and so is Kendi, by the way. Oh, that's great to hear. Let's talk about the research, and, and then I'll talk about one other thing before we wrap it up. But the research for this must have been Bananas, because the clips were like millisecond clips. I can't even imagine, like how long did it take you to research a, this film? It was a, it was a nightmare. <laughs> it took, um, what was the years? It was like three years in the making, but um, we had, you know, the book is 541 pages. Imagine taking a 541 page book and making a 90 minute film out of it. Um, I think David Teague, who's a writer, who's a, a brilliant writer, I've worked with on many films. Mm -hmm. um, I think the first, I don't know, the first sort of outline, the first script of it was like, you know, I don't know, 50 pages long. And, um, and the first cut of this film uh, was hours, it was so long that I actually dozed off during a screening. Doing your own My film? My own <laughs> film. And I was like, okay, this is a problem. <laughs> That and is hilarious. I was like, so, what, so I was like, so what are I gonna do? So, um, uh, you know, we went through also many editors, and then um, uh, Francesca Sharpner, who's a young, this is her first black African American editor, first film, um, and yeah, and um, and her and John Fisher, the other editor, they, I gave them Bacon's Rebellion. I gave them a scene, and I said, you guys, because they were. They were working on another project, right? And I said, I, I don't know what to do. I'm falling asleep during this film. So um, can you, they took it and they did the needle. They totally turned it. And I was, and I real, they turned it upside down. And I was like, oh my God, this is the language. I, we found the language of the film. And then I had to narrow this whole big book, of, a treatise of a book down. And I came up with this concept of nine lies about black people. And the nine lives gave, lies gave me a framework for structuring the film. Those are the cards the you see, the chapters. Mm -hmm. um, and then they gave me the editorial style. And once we had that, it was really about honing each of these, each of these lies, each of these moments to really reinforce visually because um, I, these ideas are you know, it's through pop culture. It's through that you, you know, that's how we infuse these um, racial ideas. And, and so it was really honing these, I mean, that was a process of honing it and honing it. And I had an amazing team of, you know, of great researchers, of archivists, you know, all African-American who really, they, this, of course, they, this is so important to all of us. So we worked hard to get it right. You got it right, and then some. So, of course, we're going to end the discussion the way the film started. What do you think is wrong with black people? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing's wrong with black people. And that's the way the book ends. So the last line in the book is the only thing wrong with black people is that you think something is wrong with black people. And it used to be the last line in the film. And then um, I, one of my amazing editorial advisors named Jean Chen, she goes, no, you should start the film with the, the question and answer it at the end. Which, which happened, that she came, like that, like, I didn't even think of that. And it happened at the end, we did that.
I love that. I love that that's how it started, and I love that that's how it ended and that it was answered. And when he says, the only thing wrong with black people is that black people think that there's something wrong with them. Well, let me tell you something, Roger Ross Williams. There is nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with Stamp from the beginning. It was fantabulous, as are your other projects, the other seven projects that he got this year (laughs) that y'all need to check out, too. But you are a fantabulous filmmaker. It has been my absolute pleasure to sit here and have this conversation with you. Before I end, though, we're having a reception out front. Everyone is invited. If you have questions for Roger, he will be out there and available for you to speak to him. But for right now, we're going to end this discussion. Thank you so much. You're, You're the best. Ver- oh, <laughs> thank you. I'm Carla Renata. Thank you. Bye.